yourself to the Lord if you visit him with us this morning. We appreciate you so much for choosing to visit with us. We want you to just remove the visitor tag. Amen. And just jump in and have church with us. We're all here to worship the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice. We will be glad. And so let's stand all over the building. Let's lift our hearts with our hands. And let's invite his presence into this place. Father, we love you. We are so thankful for the privilege that we have once again to come into your house to worship, to magnify, glorify your name. Father, you are worthy to be praised this morning. You're worthy to be exalted. God, your word tells us that if we will but draw nigh unto you, that you will draw nigh unto us. Father, we're drawn nigh to you today with our worship. And we ask, oh God, that you would inhabit the praises of your people, that you yourself would come down into this house today. Oh God, reveal yourself in a powerful way. God, I pray that you do an eternal and an everlasting work in hearts and lives and souls this morning. And Father, we're going to love you. We're going to thank you. We're going to praise you in advance for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' holy name we pray it. And the church says amen. And amen. Let's worship the Lord together in song this morning.
no one else like our God. Hallelujah. He is great and greatly to be praised. Amen. Look with us, if you will, in your hymn book this morning. Let's turn to page 268. Sing, I am on the battlefield for my Lord. Faithfully. I was alone in idle, I was a sinner too. I heard the voice from heaven say, There is work to do. I took my master's hand and joined that enemy band. Now I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Well, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Oh, 
your faithfulness. Again, if you're visiting with us, uh, just remove the visitor tag and have church with us this morning. You won't be out of order by worshiping him. That's what we've come to do in this house this morning. Amen. I'm going to ask our rushers if they will to come at this time, wait upon the congregation. And uh, I'd like to uh, just briefly mention this morning while they're coming, um, after the altar service this morning, there's going to be uh, some announcements that are shared and given. And so if you're home folk, uh, please stick around with us for a few moments after the altar service this morning to uh, share some information with you and uh, uh, for uh, just a, a time of prayer together again before we leave. So uh, that will be coming uh, briefly after our altar service this morning. So uh, as for the homer, if you will, to pray over the offering this morning.
the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Hallelujah. He is a faithful God. And if you're anchored in Him, you're anchored on good ground. Amen. Hallelujah. Again, it's good to have everyone with us. You're watching by way of live stream. Thank you so much for being with us on that uh, platform. May you feel the same God that we feel in this place this morning. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to turn with us to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 6. I'm going to read from a very familiar passage of Scripture this morning. But uh, I sought God diligently for what He would have us to say this morning. And the Lord led us to these passages of Scripture here. I believe He wants to talk to us through His Word. And meet with us in these altars this morning. In Isaiah chapter number 6, we'll begin our reading with verse number 1. We'll read down together to verse number 8. And it reads as this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims each one had six wings with twain he covered his face with twain he covered his feet with twain he did fly and one cried unto another and said holy 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 is the lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory can you say amen to that amen. and the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke then he said i woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin." Purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. Amen. I want to preach if the Lord help us for a few minutes on this thought on seeing God. On seeing God. Father, we love you today. We ask that you would add your blessings to the word of God. I need your touch. I need your anointing. I need your hand this morning, oh God, more than I ever have in my life. I'm asking that you touch us, that you would help us in this house today, that this would be a, a, a house of healing, a house of help, a, a house of hope this morning, that you would do a work, God, that only you can do, that we may, not with the eyes of the flesh, but through the lenses of the Spirit, we may see you, oh God. You do a work in hearts and lives that only you can do. We're going to love you. We're going to thank you. We're going to praise you for it all. In Jesus' name we pray it. And the church says amen. amen. And amen. In verse number one, Isaiah, the prophet, records in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord. That's an interesting phrase there at the end because if you were to if it were me, when he said, I, I saw also the Lord, that lets us know that there were many things potentially vying for his attention that he could have been focusing his eyes upon. If it were me, the, the Lord would supersede everything else that he was facing or going through, and he would just say, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. But that's not what the, the scripture says here. It says, I saw also the Lord. And if we were to put ourselves in the shoes of Isaiah when he was recording these verses, it would make sense why he would pin those words that he saw also the Lord because there were many things that he could have focused his attention on during this season of life. Number one, he, he could have focused on Uzziah. For Uzziah uh, to, to know a little bit about him in the context of Scripture Uzziah was Isaiah's uncle. Now, Uzziah was a godly king that 
uh, ruled over Judah for 52 years. He was 16 years old when he came to the to inherit the throne, and he ruled to the age of 68 uh, years of age. And as we read uh, in, in 2 Chronicles about his reign, the Bible tells us that, that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. And it says specifically that he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had an understanding in the visions of, of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Yeah. Uzziah was a, a godly king who had understanding of visions. And anything that he put his hand to do, God blessed him. God prospered him. He was a godly king. But as we study the life of Uzziah, we know that in his latter years, that pride set up in his heart. And he went astray. And he did that which was not right in the eyes of the Lord. Because in verse 16 of 2 Chronicles 26 tells us that when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction because he transgressed against the Lord. The Bible tells us specifically that he went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Now this was specifically forbidden of kings in scripture and it was given over to the role of the priest the, the, that lineage of Aaron to burn incense upon the altar of the Lord because the Lord in his government he was very clear that the kings had their roles and their functions and the priests had their roles and their function and there was to be no intermingling of the two because there's only one king and priest and that is the Lord Christ Jesus. Yeah. Amen. So Uzziah wanted to do more than what he should have done. And he began to, to uh, set out, I'm going to assume the role of the priesthood. I'm going to join this role of king and priest. And I am going to burn an incense on the altar of incense. And the Bible tells us that the high priest withstood him with 80 of his priests. And said, Uzziah, you're making a mistake. Don't do this. But Uzziah went ahead and 80 of the priests could not stop what Uzziah was trying to do. And as soon as he picked up the censure to burn incense, the Bible says that God smote him in his forehead with leprosy. And Uzziah, although he had lived right for 68 years of his life, God honored him and God blessed him. And everything that he did, he bore the reproach of leprosy, a sinner. And he died a leper because of willful disobedience before God. Amen. Uzziah, in that moment in time, he was a leper. He was cut off from all the people, cast outside of the camp. In that day, he lost his reign and Jotham, his son, began to reign over the king's house. So Isaiah sitting here, the nephew of the king, he just lost a godly influence upon his life. And no doubt his heart was broken. He could have fastened his eyes upon Uzziah. He could have focused on the failures of Uzziah, how he started out well but finished in disgrace. He could have focused on the pain of losing a loved one, watching him fall and die alone. No doubt this had to be painful. He could have focused on his own doubt where he said, God, if, if this man Uzziah was, he, he was godly. He was a godly influence on my life. And if he fell, how in the world am I ever going to make it? How in the world am I ever going to live it? If this man who the Bible said God prospered everything that he touched. I mean, if he died in disgrace and died a leper, how is there any hope for me? He could have focused on what he was going to inherit. Could the king have left me some money? Could he have left me a, a position in the kingdom? Uh, what, what is in it for me? He could have turned uh, introspective and looked to his own uh, uh, reign and his own power and prominence. Uh, I mean, he could have lived in fear, wondering, is Jotham, when he assumes the throne, uh, is he going to have? 
have uh, all of my family killed as did others kings did when they assumed the throne. Uh, wanted to wipe out all of those that were a threat to the reign. Uh, there were many things uh, Isaiah could have focused his eyes upon uh, and looked at in this moment of time. Uh, but thank God, uh, instead of focusing on those things, uh, he focused on his God. Instead of focusing uh, on all of the things that natural man could have uh, and should have focused upon, uh, he went into the temple searching uh, and went into the temple seeking after God. Uh, and I can tell you, folks, when you're seeking uh, and searching for the answers of life, uh, the house of God uh, is always a good place to start. Uh, amen. When you're facing perplexing situations uh, and you're dealing with hurt uh, and you're dealing with own personal turmoil uh, and you're don't know where to go and you don't know what to do and it seems like there's more questions in life than answers follow this man's mold find yourself in the house of God seeking the face of God searching after the heart of God it will never lead you wrong right. oh, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. hallelujah found himself in the house of God seeking after God he could rely on what Uzziah had told him about God. He could rely on what the priest had told him about God. He could rely on rumors of what other people had said for God. He had to find God for himself. And I can tell you, every man must come to the same conclusion in their life. We must have a revelation of this God for ourselves. Thank God for good preaching that we sit and we listen to. Amen. When we hear, amen, messages that is Christ-centered. Amen. Preaching God in His fullness. Amen. Thank God for godly teaching and doctrine that we know to be true. But there must come a point in time in each individual life when we we see God for ourselves. When it's not just a preacher preaching to us uh, about what they know about God. Uh, we have to have an experience with God for ourselves. Uh, for with the eyes of the Spirit, uh, we see God uh, for who He is, uh, for what He does, uh, and what He wants to do inside the heart and lives uh, of each and every individual uh, on this planet. Uh, oh, God. Uh, amen. We must uh, have a, the revelation of who He is. Uh, amen. God, uh, before He can ever be powerful Powerful in our lives. He must first be personal in our lives. Amen. Where we individually have that relationship. We have the revelation of who he is. And we're made to know the fullness. Amen. Of God in our lives. Number one, there must be a desire in our hearts to see God for ourselves. It's not enough to just have somebody testify. I preach about God, but our heart must experience Him for ourselves. If there's one thing that I've learned along this journey, God will always honor the prayer of a man or a woman oh, yes, who seeks after Him. Yes, God will always honor that prayer. Deuteronomy 4, amen, He told the children of Israel, but it is very much applicable to us today. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, Thou shalt find him. If you will seek the Lord, you will find him. If thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. And when thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou wilt turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice. For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither will he destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of the fathers which he swear unto them. Uh, amen. I can tell you that was written to the children of Israel uh, thousands of years ago, but I can tell you uh, it's applicable to us, uh, you and I, the church of the living God. Uh, if we will but seek him, uh, amen, if we will seek after him with all of our heart, uh, all of our soul, uh, all of our mind, all of our strength, uh, we will find him. Uh, and when we find him, hallelujah, amen, he says he, 
will not forsake us. I can tell you man may forsake you, but our God never will. Man may let you down, but our God will never let us down. Amen. He won't destroy us, nor will he forget the covenant that he's made with us. For our God is a covenant-keeping God. If he said it in his word, he will do it exactly like he said it. And I believe that the covenant with God and man is still true. That if we will but seek after him, we can find him. Hallelujah. Isaiah went into the temple seeking after God. And guess what? He found him. Because in the year King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord. When you set out your heart to seek God, that covenant is still true that we can still find him. Amen. If you're looking for a New Testament confirmation of that, Jesus said, ask. And it shall be given. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. God has obligated himself in his word. That he that seeks after him. He will find him. He will reveal himself to any man. That's willing to look unto God. Amen. If you're looking unto God. He's not going to leave you orphaned. He's not going to leave you out on a limb to yourself. He's not going to leave you forsaken. No, no. But to the man that's seeking after God. You might have to seek. More than five minutes. You might have to pray a little bit more than a now and lay me down to sleep in prayer. But when you get serious with God and you seek after Him in His fullness, He will reveal Himself in His fullness unto you. And you can know the God that Isaiah knew. You can know the God that this covenant keeping God that will make Himself real and alive to any man that's willing to search for Him. He saw the Lord. When Isaiah saw the Lord, he saw him in the glory of his holiness. For verse number one, we've read it. I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the temple above it. Stood the seraphims, each having six wings with two. He covered his face. Two, he covered his feet. The two we did fly. And they cried to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. When Isaiah saw the Lord and his holiness, we see four characteristics that he saw. Number one, it says that he was high and lifted up. Folks, God is always going to be on a higher plane than us. I know that man has attempted through humanism, through this hyper-grace movement of easy believism to try to bring God down to our level. But I can tell you that's not the plight of Christianity. The plight of Christianity is God by His Son and through His Spirit. To bring man up to his level. Amen. The, the word of God tells us. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. For the heavens are higher than the earth. So are my ways higher than your ways. And my God's in your thoughts. Why would we want to serve a God. That would be brought down to our level. On our same plane. Amen. To be reduced down to the same. Things that you and I face. Amen. You and I. Amen. What, what we experience. Amen. Listen folks. I, I don't want a humanistic God. But I want a holy God. I want one. Amen. That 
that uh, is higher than us, uh, who knows the way, uh, amen, who is, whose knowledge supersedes, uh, amen, man's knowledge, whose infinite mind uh, supersedes the finite understanding of man. Uh, now in that, uh, we see the redemptive plan in that uh, God sent his son in the likeness uh, of flesh uh, to build a bridge to where a fallen man, uh, amen, might ascend back to a holy God, uh, amen, a holy God descended down uh, to a fallen man so that a fallen man might have sinned uh, back to a holy God. Uh, the work of Calvary was not uh, to reduce God to man's level. Uh, amen. But it was to build a bridge uh, so that you and I by the redemptive work of Christ uh, and the holiness of God Almighty uh, could be brought up back in the union with God uh, on His level. He was high. Amen. Secondly, He was holy. When the seraphims, I, I, I know that there are many catchphrases of God. God is love. God is peace. God is joy. All of those things, yes, he is. But when those seraphims, when those cherubims flew around the throne of God, they weren't saying love, love, love. Peace, 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 joy, 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 no. But they were saying holy, holy, holy. That, that word holy in the Hebrew is the word kadash, which means to be hallow, to be clean, to be separate, to be consecrated. And I can tell you, folks, God is all of those things. This morning, he's still holy. Hallelujah. This morning, he's still holy. I'm dealing with you about the characteristics of God when we see him. Isaiah saw him. He was high. He was holy. And the Bible says that he was sitting on a throne. I find that very interesting. Because as we study kingdoms, and I heard Queen Elizabeth say this before her passing. They were interviewing her and they talked about the throne room in England. And they asked, they said, Queen Elizabeth, we don't see you sitting on, in the throne room a whole lot. And she said, well, heavens no. She said, that's the most uncomfortable chair in all the kingdom. She said, it's a very uncomfortable place. She said, but it was designed to be that way. It's not made for comfort. Said, but the only time that a king or a queen is to sit on the throne is to render judgment or to oversee a matter pertaining to the kingdom. But there are three times in Scripture that we find the heavens opened. Here in Isaiah 6 is one. In Acts chapter number 7, when Stephen peers into the heavens, and in Revelations, chapter number four, when John is there, in all three of those descriptions, we find the Father sitting on the throne. We find him sitting down. Amen. Why is that? Because our God, our King, and our Judge, he is always watching over the affairs of his kingdom. He's always uh, paying a close attention to what's going on. Uh, he's continuously executing judgment uh, in his righteousness. Uh, he's overseeing the work uh, of his kingdom. Abraham asked the question, uh, shall not the judge of all the earth do uh, what's right? Uh, I can tell you our king, uh, amen, I, I, I have uh, an earthly president, but you hear me, he ain't my king. Hallelujah. I have congressmen. I have representatives. I, I have an earthly government, but I can tell you eh, the heavenly government that I've been born into. Uh, hallelujah. It supersedes uh, any earthly throne, uh, than any earthly man, uh, than any earthly edict. Uh, amen. The judge uh, of all the earth. Uh, he reigns in righteousness. Uh, he's constantly sitting uh, on the throne. Uh, amen. Looking at the ongoings uh, and the affairs of men. Uh, constantly executing executing judgment and he always does that which is right hallelujah our politicians may do us wrong 
And that seems to happen uh, on a second by second basis. Uh, but the king uh, of all the earth, uh, hallelujah, he always uh, does what's right. Uh, he always uh, reigns and rules in righteousness uh, and in holiness. Uh, he's never had to apologize uh, for signing a wrong bill. Uh, he's never had to apologize uh, for doing something wrong. Uh, but the God, uh, the judge of all the earth, uh, that's sitting on the throne, uh, he is right uh, and he always does right right by us. Isaiah. Characteristics of his holiness. He's high. He's holy. He's sitting on his throne. And the Bible says his train filled the temple. Several years ago, I heard a preacher preach this and it stuck with me. I when I first started preaching, I didn't have a lot to preach. I think I brought this out in every message. I had to preach. So it was so good, but it's been about 15 years since I've been here. Maybe you forgot it, so I'll give you a reminder. It's an interesting phrase. When it's, he said his train filled the temple. To be able to understand that phrase, you have to understand military conquest. And biblical days and throughout those middle ages. Because when a king would conquer another king, he would bring him into the city. He would strip him of his robe. And oftentimes he would walk through the streets what they would consider naked, which would be in their, their long johns. That walk through is a sign of humiliation. As a sign that you have been defeated and conquered and you have been stripped of all of your power. And when they brought that king into the presence of the conquering king, he would take out or have his servants take out a knife or their sword and he would cut the train off of that king's royal robe and he would then take that detached Train, which is symbolic of stripping him, stripping him of his power, of his authority, stripping him of his dominance, stripping him of his reputation. He has now been conquered and defeated. They would cut off the train uh, and they would attach it to the train of the conquering king. And so that would be a sign that the power that you had in your kingdom, it's now mine. The authority that you one time had, it now belongs to me. The, 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 the power, amen, the reign that you had, I, I now reign in your place. So when Isaiah looked into the heavenlies, he saw the Lord high and lifted up and holy. The Bible said that his train filled the temple. Amen. The train was so long that it literally filled the temple. Amen. It, 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 it filled the place. There was room for nothing else but the train that lets us know our God has conquered. Hallelujah. Every kingdom has conquered every foe. Has conquered every battle. He's conquered every addiction. He's conquered every hurt. My God. He's conquered every sickness. He's conquered every temple. Temptation, and he has all power and over and, and all authority over that this morning. You may be battling sickness in your body. I can tell you his train fills the temple. He's got authority over that sickness. You may be battling a broken heart. Amen. I can tell you he's already conquered that. Our God's train, it fills the temple. Whatever you're facing this morning, he already has power and dominion and authority authority over that. Hell has already been stripped. He's already been plundered. Amen. His train has been cut off. God has the keys of death. Hell and the grave. I've got good news. His train fills the temple because he has all power, all authority over all of the affairs of this world. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That'll make a Presbyterian want to run a lap around the building right there. My God. You may not feel that like I do. Because I've got some giants I'm facing this morning. But my God already has all power. His train 
fills the temple. And you want to know why? I get shout happy thinking about that. Amen. Because the same revelation that Isaiah saw some 2,600 to 3,000 years ago, every one of those revelations are still true today. For God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. He's still high this morning. Hallelujah. He's still holy this morning. He's still sitting on his throne of righteousness and rolling in holiness. Hallelujah. And his train still fills the temple. I know we may have, uh, amen, some temptations and we may have some trials uh, that are unique to us uh, that you think Isaiah may not have had. Uh, I mean, there is nothing new under the sun. Uh, it's the same devil. Uh, it's the same temptation. It's the same test. Uh, and it's the same trials. Uh, but just as much today uh, as then, uh, God still has all victory. Hallelujah. God still has all victory uh, in his hands. Uh, his train still fills the temple. Uh, and whatever you need, He's got the answer for. Characteristics of his holiness. We see the desire in Isaiah's heart to see God. God honored that desire. He saw him. When he saw the Lord, he saw him and the truths of his holiness. But third, when we see God and his holiness, we will immediately be made to see ourselves in our unholiness. I never saw this before until yesterday. I began to study the chapters leading up to Isaiah chapter number 6. I found something very interesting. As a reminder, Isaiah is a prophet. He's a preacher. In Isaiah chapter 3 number 11, he says, Woe unto the wicked. The reward of his hand shall be given him. And Isaiah 5, we find six woes that he pronounces in judgment. Woe unto them that join house to house that lay in the field. Woe unto them that rise up early that they may follow strong drink. Woe to them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink and men of strength to mingle strong drink. He was a man, a preacher that would bust your hide, hang you over hell. Woe unto you. Woe unto you. Woe unto you. He was a preacher with a backbone. And I want you to notice something. When he saw God and his holiness. When he saw God, received the revelation, the holiness of God, he cried woe. But he didn't cry woe unto them. He said, woe is me. Woe is me. Because when we see God in his holiness, we see us. And our unholiness. When we see God and his righteousness, we're made to realize that our righteousness, the Bible says, is as a filthy rags. Amen. There's, there's no way that we can measure up. When he saw God high and lifted up, he was consciously aware of just how low he was and just how much he needed God. You see, church, when we see God, other shortcomings won't be put on display, but he will shine the light onto the faults of his own heart, of our own hearts. Amen. And we, like Isaiah, will be made to realize, woe is me. Woe is me, for I am undone. Amen. I heard Brother Kenny Morris say one time, he was praying a prayer. Amen. Thinking, Lord, show me my heart. Show me my heart. And he said he saw a vision of his heart and he didn't like what he saw. Amen. 
He said he, he saw his heart, uh, but in the bottom quadrant of his heart, uh, there was a black spot that was there. Uh, and that black spot was small, but it again began to branch off, uh, and it began to grow. Uh, and he began to seek the face of God and say, Lord, uh, what is that spot? Uh, and God called to his remembrance. Uh, years ago, a man had done him wrong, uh, and God spoke to him and said, uh, you hate that man. He said, Lord, I'll admit to you, I don't like him none. But I don't hate him. He said, yes, you do. You've let this thing fester for years. And you've never made it right. Amen. And God said, before you will ever grow in me, you've got to make this thing right. Amen. He began to weep and cry. And he repented over that. He went to that brother. Amen. That had done him wrong years ago. And he said, I just want to let you know. God's dealt with me. I've harbored, harbored bitterness. I've had bad feelings against you. And my heart, I forgive you. And I want to make this thing right. They wept. They cried. They reconciled. He went back to the altar of prayer. God showed him his heart again. And he saw that black spot as it began to shrink. Amen. And God took it away. I can tell you, folks, the Bible said that the heart is the Deceitfully wicked, and who can know it? It matters not how high and how holy we think we are, and how much we pronounce woe unto others and say, Whoa, 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 unto you. When we get into the presence of God and He shines the light on us, we will come to the same conclusion as Isaiah and say, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man in need of grace. I am a man in need of mercy. I'm I'm a man in need of redemption. And God, I must have you. I said, heart, deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? That word, des desperately wicked, is interpreted mortally sick. Our hearts as human is mortally sick. If you don't believe it, this ticker has an expiration date. And there's going to come a day when it's going to expire. Just as sure as there's a date on a birth certificate, if the Lord tarries is coming, there will be a date on a death certificate. Amen. To where this heart expires. It is mortally sick. It's mortally wounded. It's flesh bound. It's earth bound. And if we're going to do anything for God, if we're going to make a difference in this world, we must have him. We must come to the end of ourselves and say, Lord, amen, my heart is mortally wounded. I'm flesh. I'm sinful. I need the remedy. I need you. He said, woe is me. That phrase in the Hebrew, woe is me, means I am worthy of death. Here's a preacher who's preached to others for five chapters. And when he sees God, he said, Lord, forgive me. I'm worthy of death. What was me for I am undone? That word undone, it means to be dumb or silent. He said, Lord, I, I'm worthy of death and I have no words. I've been preaching to others for five chapters. But Lord, when I see you and your holiness, I see me and my unholiness. And Lord, I've got nothing else to say. I've got nothing to give anybody. I can't go another step the way I've been going. I, I can't preach another message. I, I can't sing another song. I, I can't teach another lesson. I, I can't testify again. I, I'm undone. I, I'm unworthy. Amen. I, 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 I'm worthy of death. And Lord, uh, the words have escaped me. I have nothing else to say. In other words, as I said, in the light of your holiness and in the condition of my heart, I can't preach. Nothing I can say will lead me to fix this utter chasm between God and man. We're all together different. You're higher than me. You're holier than me. And there's nothing I can do in and of myself. There's no words. There's no intellect. There's no knowledge. There's no understanding. There's nothing I can do to reach to where you are. And the fact of the matter is, folks, that this is a microcosm and the reality of 
every single one of us. The Bible says that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all worthy of death. We're all worthy, amen, uh, of death. Amen, we're all undone. If anybody could say I'm a good man, I'm all right, it was Isaiah. He was a prophet. Amen. He was a preacher. He was of royal seed, the lineage of the king. Amen. People were to look at him and think this man has it all together. This man is all right. But in the light of God's holiness, he said nothing. Amen. Can fix this. I am worthy of death. Amen. It is just like us. It's just like the apostle Paul when he said in Romans 7, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Amen. What did it take for Paul the same thing that it took for Isaiah. He had to have a revelation of this Christ. He had to have an experience with Christ on that Damascus road where scales of flesh fell from his eyes and he beheld the holiness of God. He saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train filled the temple. I can tell you folks, there's the only hope Isaiah had. It's the only hope Paul had and it's the only hope you and I have that we have have a revelation of this Christ that he becomes personally alive unto us and that he reconciles us from the wretched fallen state of sin back into the splendor and the majesty of his redemption and his true holiness by Christ Jesus. That is our only hope. Our only hope when we see Christ and his holiness, ourselves and our unholiness, Shows the controversy of the age. There's nothing man can do to reach the lofty heights of God on our own. God has to make a way. Thank God the story doesn't end there. With Isaiah being left undone. And Isaiah being left worthy of death. For it was in that moment of time. God in his holiness, Isaiah in his unholiness. That here come one of the seraphims, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. He laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. And also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. There were three things that happened to reconcile Isaiah. Number one, God touched him. God sent one of those seraphims. said, you take a coal off that altar. You take of that fire that had been commanded that never goes out in the temple of the Lord. You take that and you touched him. You touch his life. Aren't you thankful, folks, for the touch of God? Aren't you thankful? Amen. The Lord, the Lord would reach down by His grace and by His mercy and touch us. Hallelujah. I read a devotional the other day about, you may hear this in a message in the not too distant future, when Peter cut off the high priest's uh, soldier, Malchus. He cut off his ear when Jesus was in Gethsemane. The Bible said that Jesus picked up the ear and He touched him. And He healed his ear. But that word touch there that was used in scripture, it's an interesting word in the Greek that means that he touched him and he provided a touch where he wouldn't let go. <laughs> that may not do for you what it does for me, but thank God that when he touches us, he don't let us go. Hallelujah. Thank God that when he touches us, uh, he keeps his hand upon us. Hallelujah. That he upholds us by uh, his right hand. Uh, amen. The only hope that man has uh, is to be touched uh, by God Almighty. And notice what he was touched with. Uh, he was touched with the fire. Uh, fire always is a representation uh, of the Spirit of God. Uh, the Holy Ghost. Uh, amen. It is a purifying agent. Uh, amen. God. Uh, amen. Said, boy, I know you're impure. Uh, I know you're unworthy. Uh, I know you're 
you're unholy, but I've got a fire that's going to touch your life and it's going to purify you. Hallelujah. Amen. It's going to take away your iniquity. It's going to purge your sins. And as I am holy, you can be holy in this present world. That's what the touch of God does in the life of the individual. Not only does he touch us, but he changes us. Amen. There's never been a man that God has left him in the same condition that he found him in. Amen. But every man that God touches, he produces a change. A change for the better. He trades our unrighteousness for his righteousness. He trades our unholiness for his true holiness. Hallelujah. He trades our sin for his redemption. He trades our shortfalls for his mercy and his grace. Thank God for his touch. Thank God for his change. Touched him. He changed him. Lo, this fire hath touched thy lips. And iniquity is taken away. My sin is purged. Say it all the time. I'm not the man I'm going to be. Brother Meeks, thank God I'm not the man I used to be. My life has been changed. I'm closing with this. My musicians would come. Not only did God touch him, God changed him. But then God called him. When Isaiah was made to realize the magnitude of God's grace, I said, all right, son, what I've done in you, I mean, I want, to be, I want you to be a catalyst. Amen. That I may do through you. Preach my word. He said, Lord, the Lord said, whom shall I send? Who will I go? Isaiah said, Lord, I'll answer the call. I'll answer the call. Here am I. Lord, send me. I'll go. I'll be. I'll do. We see the full microcosm, the full cycle of the work of grace right here in this story. We're made to be aware of the holiness of God, the unholiness of man. The only thing that can touch us and change us is God Himself by His Spirit. And once we're changed, God sends us out. So go preach this message. Go find somebody else. And let me do for them what I've done for you. Hallelujah. By the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, He's made a way that a fallen man may ascend back to the holy God. Physically, I don't have to have a coal off of the altar to touch my lips, burn my lips. No, no, no. Jesus took care of that on the cross by his blood. I put my faith in that shed blood. I'm washed. I'm cleansed. But I can tell you spiritually, folks, we've got to have that purifying agent, the purifying work of the Spirit. Amen. That makes us as He is. Hallelujah. Seeing God this morning, I know that there's many different things in this world that we could fasten our eyes upon, and there's many voices. There's many things vying for our attention. But this morning, could we focus our eyes upon the one thing that's right? Could we, like Isaiah, Shut every voice, shut everything, close the door on everything else. Say, Lord, I want to see you. Lord, I want to see you. I've got to have you. I've got to have a touch. Woe is me, Lord. I need you. I need you to do a work in me. Amen. I believe God wants to do it for us this morning. Amen. When we hit these altars this morning, let's hit God. Or let's. Hit them with the mentality and with the urgency. Lord, let me see you. Let me see myself. And Lord, do a work in me. Whatever you have to do, Lord, reconcile me back to you. Lord, let me be holy in every area of my life. Not just, God, outwardly, but inwardly. God, not just 
in one area, but in every area of my life. Make me holy as you're holy. Make me pure as you're pure. Make me righteous as you're righteous. Do a work on me. It starts out, folks, with setting your affections on things above, with fastening your eyes upon this Christ. Amen. That he may reveal himself. Amen. In his majesty and in his splendor. If you're here and you're lost, Amen. He's the answer. If you're here with questions, he's got the answer. His train fills the temple. All power is in his hands. Whatever you need, the answer is him. He's yea and he's amen. Stand with me all over the building. We're done this morning. Father, I love you. I pray, oh God, for the next few moments in this service, do the work that only you can do in every heart and every life. God, my prayer, my prayers in every individual can leave here saying, I've seen the Lord. God, if they see me, they gain nothing. They just hear me, they gain nothing. But Lord, if they see you and if they hear your voice, they gain everything this morning. And I'm asking, Lord, reveal yourself. Reveal yourself, God, on a deeper, more personal, more intimate level than ever before. That we can leave saying, I've received it. He's touched me. He's changed me. And I'm going to walk this walk. I'm going to obey His voice. I'm going to answer the call. Be all He wants me to be. Do all He wants me to do. Amen. Well, no matter where you are on the spiritual plane this morning, could you join this preacher in the altar? Could you join this preacher in the altar this morning? And allow God to work. And allow God to move. Allow God to touch. To change. Allow God to heal. Allow God to help. Allow God to breathe. Allow God to heal, to feel whatever He desires to do. Hallelujah. Let's come looking for Him. Let's come searching for Him. If we will, but seek for Him. We will find Him, saith the Lord. Hallelujah.